I'm here with Alexander Bard. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Owen, for having me. So you're a philosopher, a Swedish guy, and I recently read one of your books, Digital Libido, which I found to be, well, do you know what? I'll tell you, it got me in trouble twice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So the first was, I was actually in a, uh, a meditation retreat center, a Vipassana center, and I was reading it and someone came and said, that's not a Dharma book. You shouldn't be reading that. And I was like, ah, uh, <laughs> you know, I was sitting here reading your book about desire in the digital age, supposedly trying to meditate to free myself from my desires and causing myself probably more confusion than, <laughs> than perhaps was necessary. Well, I am a Hegelian philosopher more than anything, so I would probably say that uh, freeing yourself from your desire is unfortunately in itself a desire, so you can't do that. Well, absolutely, and I think that was what I was grappling with, and I'm sitting there like, mm, something doesn't quite make sense here. I don't know what these Buddhist guys are trying to achieve. Clearly something, I mean, something was working. I was feeling the meditation working, but I was also yeah. like, I'm all for meditation and contemplation. Actually, I'm working on, I'm a Zoroastrian. So I decided to convert to Zoroastrianism instead of Buddhism and Taoism. Although I, of course, studied all those three religions for a long time because that's essentially Eastern philosophy. But um, uh, we are now working within the Zoroastrian community in, 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 in resurrecting traditions of meditation and contemplation that are over 3,000 years old. They're called Daina, so the, the, that will be something like a Daina center. And then you have a Tusha Mirti, so you have different traditions that are sort of ancient Persian traditions of meditation and contemplation. All these traditions were traded between China, Japan on one end, and Persian India on the other along the Silk Road. So all these different Eastern traditions we're importing now to the West when it comes to meditation and contemplation are techniques that were developed over thousands of years, both in India and Persia and China. Mm. So I guess the question that pops up there is if the Buddhist style meditation is about trying to attain liberation from your desires, then in a Zoroastrian sense, what would you be trying to do? You wouldn't be trying to do anything like that. You know, remember that Zoroastrianism is the opposite of Platonism. And, and there is this trait within Buddhism and Platonism. Uh, I would say that a lot of Western Buddhists today are, are tending more and more towards a Neoplatonist worldview, which I'm very opposed to. Mm. The Zoroastrians would say that your desire and your drive are you. There's no point in trying to get rid of them because there'd be nothing left if they were gone. So, you know, you have your desire, you have your drive. You can even say you have an instinct, which is even more primordial than the drive. And you can also aspire for transcendence. And that's a drive. That's really should be described as a drive. And you probably discovered it now when you're reading Digital Libido that we're actually talking about not only two or three, but four different drives that we mm. humans deal with. Uh, instinct is obviously the animalistic one. That's the drive we share with animals. Animals operate on instinct and so do we to a large part. Then you have uh, the drive, the pure drive in itself, which has an almost mechanistic, eerie quality to it. So that's like hunger, horniness, thirst, things like that are categories that belong to pure drive. It's a drive those, without any complications to it. And those are different from instinct. How? Yes, they are. They should definitely be described different from instincts because they're, they're, they're different to human. Um, animals don't contemplate on their hunger. They don't contemplate on their thirst and mm. then consider well, how they're going to act on it. They're just hungry and they go for anything they can eat. So, so that's instinct and that's drive. But then there's also desire, which is exclusively human. So this is the most human of the drives. And this is a byproduct of using language. The fact that we have symbols means that we're distanced from the world. And we often take language itself or mathematics for that matter to be more real than reality itself. Of course, that's a fallacy, but we do. It's a byproduct of being human. So desire is what happens within us when we start using language. Uh, Jacques Lacan, the famous French psychoanalyst, used an example where he said that desire is ultimately to try to find the perfect woman. He would just say the woman, right? So yeah. you, if you're a man and you're, and you're heterosexual and you go looking for women, you, all, you always try to find the perfect woman, every woman you meet, and you never find her because the idea of woman can never be found in a woman. And, and it's the idea that drives you, it's the idea of finding woman that drives you. This is, this is 
perfect example of what, how desire operates. And desire ultimately doesn't want to achieve what it fools you into believing you want because desire wants to be maintained. So desire will always move to something else. So whenever you found something where, oh God, this is what I wanted so badly and I finally got it, your desires already moved on to something different. Mm. So it's like a curse. And I think what we're trying to do in meditation and contemplation is to, to deal with that. So Rastas would say you have to accept it. It's just the way things work and it's kind of beautiful. Buddhists are struggling with it and they try to get around it. Like, you know, why don't I get rid of this constant desire? So, so the, the, this, the, this desire that always escapes itself. So Rastas would say that's impossible. Buddhists would say it is possible. So they would claim that's a kind of Buddhist enlightenment. So they would meditate towards that goal. Um, and so would a, a European sort of Christian Platonist person do. It, it comes out of dualism, this fantasy that you can separate yourself from your desire. Whereas Orestians, just like Taoists, if you do Taoist meditation in China, they would also say that, no, no, there's no way you can separate yourself from desire because you cannot separate, se separate your mind from your body. You're embodied. Everything you do is embodied. Therefore, you cannot separate from it. But I would say that there's a fourth category of driving that's transcendence. And that is that inside of you that desires for you to be part of something bigger than yourself. And that should really be described as a drive. It's so fundamentally human. The fact that we want to have babies, we want to have children, we want something outside of ourselves, we want our lives to expand even through other life forms, even through having children. And, and the same thing goes for, say, religion or you know, anything visionary out there. What we're really lacking in society today is an understanding of transcendence. Like, how could I be part of something that's bigger and higher than myself? Mm. So like a sense of belonging and participating in something. Yeah. And I mean, that's obviously a drive. That's a deep, mm. deep, a deep desire. But I would separate it from desire. I say desire is this game that language plays with us where we always want something new. Like, okay, as soon as you got your little Christmas present from your parents, you're already dreaming about next year's Christmas when you're going to get your next gift, aren't you? Right, exactly. Mm. So, um, but transcendence is how you work with that. You, you keep that, you realize desire is a part of your human life, but you can also transcend that. And that you do by being part of something bigger than yourself, that's more meaningful than your own little pity arrangements. Mm. And it is... I know you're quite critical of, of Plato and that dualist worldview. Yes. Is that rooted in desire? Because there's no, that, this... that's, that's rooted in that Plato sub absolute bullshit. That's not how we function and that's not how the world works. The world is fundamentally modest. The universe is a modest phenomenon. Everything in the universe affects everything else. Everything is interrelated to everything else. And actually everything we know comes out of these relations. Relations are primary. Movement is primary. Change is primary. The, the idea, the idea that Plato represents is more the idea of you shot a still photograph of the world and that's the world. Mm. But I mean, you know, as soon as you shot a still photograph of the world, the world has already moved on and started changing and become something different. It's constantly becoming. This is what Nietzsche works with. This is what Heidegger works with. This is what Gilles Deleuze, my favorite, favorite 20th century philosopher, the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, this is what they're all working with. They're all working with becoming, being prior to, to being. Being is more like an illusion. And, and I, I, we even say in our work, Jan Sedekvist and I, we wrote a book called The Global Empire, where we constructed something we call the dialectics of eternalism and nobilism and really work with these metaphors from, say, the world of photography or the world of film, because it's actually very useful for, for modern human beings. Um, we have to freeze the world to grapple with it and try to understand it. So we eternalize the world. As soon as you freeze the world, say in a still photograph, you have eternalized it. Mm. That photograph itself will, will present the world in a manner where the world doesn't change. But we must not fool ourselves into believing that this is real. That this world is somehow more real than the world that's constantly changing, which is what Plato believed. And Christianity inherited this. And I think, especially in America today, I see a strong sort of movement towards Neoplatonism. And we must attack it simply because it is, it, it's not factual. It's not correct. The world doesn't operate that way. And our own minds cannot operate separate from our bodies. 
This is the Gnostic fantasy, Gnostic fantasy that, that somehow your, your spirit is higher than your body and therefore you must one day get rid of the body and somehow your spirit could then operate freely on its own. It's a bit like uploading in Silicon Valley, you know, all these transhumanists who want to upload themselves and say, what the fuck are you going to upload yourself into? Well, some kind of computer. Yeah, but I mean, how are you going to jerk off? How are you going to eat? How are you going to do anything that's meaningful to human being when you're mm -hmm. uploading? It's going to be horrible. You cannot mm. make it horrible. And every Platonist fantasy, including the Christian heaven, when you look into these fantasies, they're horrible. So that's exactly why the Bible doesn't mention the heavens with a single word. It doesn't describe what life in the heavens would be like. Because if you really thought it through, it would be somewhere between vampires and zombies, right? Mm. You'd be kind of the living dead, but you'd also be bloodthirsty and hating yourself for not being able to kill yourself. Uh, it's funny. This brings me to the second way that your book got me in trouble, which is that I was, uh, I was dating someone who was Christian, and I was making the case for the dialectic <laughs> and mobilism, <laughs> and it didn't go down so well. And, uh, well, we're not dating anymore. Okay. Well, I'm not a Christian, and I don't believe in the virgin birth. I don't believe the res resurrection happened. You know, the fundamental beliefs that you must sign on to if you're a Christian, that Christians have insisted on for the past 2,000 years. I don't believe in any of it. I think it's bullshit. But I'm not sort of a modern, banal, new atheist either, because I also understand that religion is mythical. And religion presents mythologies to us that are actually very useful. And you can't read the Bible literally. Uh, you can't read the Bible as a logos, as, as a, for example, the way you read a manual before you go on a hunt. You know, or, or I was a strategist in the military. I mean, there's obviously a logical world. So you do logos, okay? In that sense, when the Bible talks about logos or Jesus personifying logos, they mean that Jesus is phallic more than anything. They, but they never, it's never the intention of these biblical stories that should be interpreted literally. So I would say the new atheists are committing the same mistake as the religious fundamentalists are doing by doing a literal reading of a text that wasn't supposed to be literally read. It was, to be, it was supposed to be symbolically read. It's mythos, it's not logos. When and you say that Jesus is phallic, what does that mean? Just for anyone listening who's not familiar with the lingo. The lingo. Oh, okay, okay. So we have two types of storytelling. We call these phallic and magical. And obviously they relate to gods and goddesses or fathers and mothers or men or women or whatever in a sort of rudimentary sense. But what phallic storytelling does, is phallic storytelling is a linear storytelling. It's striving towards something higher and better than what we know today. Of course, Christianity pretended to be phallic in this sense, but it was actually more magical than it was phallic. The magical storytelling is the circular one. It's the one that says that everything returns to the same. The seasons return. This is spring, then comes summer, then comes fall, then comes winter, then we're back at spring again. It's just a new year, but it's spring again, right? So the circular storytelling is the one that uh, you give birth to babies, babies will one day grow up, they'll become fully grown men and women, they'll be fathers and mothers, they'll have babies, then they die. And, and then the babies will become fathers and mothers, et cetera, et cetera. So circular storytelling is a fundamental story on how the world operates. And mythical storytelling is always, in this sense, circular. It is really a story between the mother and the child more than anything. Or it's a story told by men to the mother and the child, directed towards the mother and the child, directed towards men's ultimate purpose, which is, of course, to serve women and children because they're the future. So... That's magical storytelling. The phallic storytelling is the one you tell the guys when they're going to get out in the morning and go hunting or go to warfare or something like that. But it's also in a larger sense, once we arrive at written language, we started writing phallic storytelling like we're going to create a better world than the one we currently have. And we used religion and we used political ideology and all these things to formulate dreams and goals. And the point is not to reach the goals, obviously. The point is that they set out a direction for where our society is heading. And this is what guys like Jordan Peterson and me and everybody else around at the moment are pointing out is the current meaning crisis because we're lacking 
phallic storytelling. We've arrived at a time in, in history when we're so afraid of the phallic because we associate the phallic with fake phalluses like Adolf Hitler and, and Joseph Stalin and they, their ideologies and uh, how they're gonna you know, conquer the world and change the world for the better, but they were just little boys who had really distorted fantasies. So we need to understand what is an authentic phallic story, which really is a story about how we're gonna save the world and make it better. Because if we're gonna solve the climate crisis and lock in the nuclear bombs and don't blow ourselves up, the, the, the existential threats we're facing now have to be addressed in a utopian phallic manner. We cannot address them any other way. That's exactly why I'm so skeptical of environmentalism because it is turning to ecomoralism and ecomoralism is gonna kill us, it's not gonna help us at all. And the response to that we're working on our, with our philosophy is something called ecotopianism. Mm. And ecotopianism is the idea that by uh, setting out a plan for how we're gonna avoid the next ice age, we can maintain a population of 10 billion people on the planet. And whoops, suddenly the current climate crisis has to be solved on the way there. Through technology, the problems that are caused by technology can also only be solved using technology. That's ecotopianism, and that's a utopian phallic perspective. Young engineers love it. But it's the exact opposite of the Greta Thunberg phenomenon and the current ecomoralism that is dominating with the environment. So mm. phallic and metrical, both are needed. A society needs both phallic storytelling, logos, and it needs magical storytelling mythos. And Jesus is a, was, did you say it was a, a false phallic storytelling? That he's a, how did that come about? With he Christian? died on the cross. Mm. He failed in a phallic sense. Ever since then, Christianity has, of course, tried to reinterpret that, but that's exactly why Christianity ended up being so vulnerable to manichaeism. And Christianity, as we know, it starts with Augustine. And Augustine was a Manichaean, he was a Gnostic. He was essentially a guy who hated his own body and loved his own mind. He was a Neoplatonist. I mean, he read Plotinus and, and, and then he became a Neoplatonist and he was a Gnostic and he sat in Northern Egypt and he basically dictated where Christianity was going to head. And all the different varieties of Christianity today, Catholicism, Orthodox Christianity, Protestant Christianity, they all date back to Augustine. They all date back to the idea that the spirit is higher than the body, that we must hate the body and love our own minds. Christians will probably disagree with it until they actually have to make a priority between mind and body. I refuse to. I do not make a priority between mind and body. You know, it, the mind is completely dependent on the body to operate. You cannot separate the two. But the Gnostics wanted to do exactly that because they believed that the, or the world as we know it is an evil creation and goodness can, can only come out of recognizing this new creation and our spirits must be set free and leave this world. And that's exactly for all practical reasons where Christianity arrived too. Christianity said the world was created good, but sin came into the world and then it became the same thing as the Gnostics believe. It becomes a horrible world. And that's exactly what Christianity finds it so hard to deal with the sexual drive and with the sexual force, uh, which actually religion has to deal with and Christianity refused to. No wonder you ended up with the Catholic Church and 2,000 years of history of pedophile priests, you know, you know, raping babies, essentially. That's exactly how dirty Christianity has been and been all along because it did not include sexuality within its own religion. Uh, you have to. Um, that's pathos. That's a third storytelling. Today we'd call it pornography. It's tragically what we usually consume online. That's somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of broadband use in the world today is actually pathic. It's pornography, right? Path is the third story about the tribe. It's a story about the grown-up man and the grown-up woman meeting in sexual intercourse. That's what pathos is. So you got mythos, you got logos, and you got pathos. Religion has to include all three. Christianity tried to get rid of paths and throw it out of the picture and basically said, sex is something you must only do when you're a married man, a married woman, to have a baby and nothing else. Don't ever think about it. You know? mm. um, and I think that is because it arrived at the guy who failed at his phallic project. So he died on the cross with his mother standing next to him, the, the devouring mother of anybody's Virgin Mary. That's exactly why our picture of Jesus is always still as the child, as a Jesus child sitting on the lap of his mother. It's the Virgin Mary and the Jesus child. I would say that that means Christianity is a religion that worships the child, not the grown up. And so therefore it's a magical religion. It turns itself inwards and it worships mother and child 
fundamentally because the son died on the cross and he killed his own father in the process. Mm. That's why I'm not a Christian. I'm a Zoroastrian. Mm. The idea of the Messiah comes from Zoroastrianism. It's called the Zoroastrian. And the Zoroastrians would never have recognized a failed Messiah died on the cross as the Messiah. They would say the Zoroastrian really is the phallic leader that does lead us. Therefore, there's a connection to Judaism, which is interesting, because there is a story in the Old Testament about a successful phallic project. That's Moses and Aaron leading the Hebrews out of Egypt. And that's what we return to in our philosophy and said, that is the ultimate story of the phallic project. Who is going to come with me and leave slavery and become masters of their own destiny by walking into another land being prepared to die on the way so your children can live free. Mm. And then that is the perfect phallic project. It has two patriarchs at the front. Matriarchy only has one. The priestess and the oldest woman is usually the same person. She pushes the world forward. That's exactly why Virgin Mary is alone. You worship her alone in Christianity is the only woman involved there as the matriarch, right? She's, she's the mother of the God, the ultimate matriarch. But the patriarch must be two. We must separate the chieftain from the priest. Mm. And this is what we mistakenly in Gnosticism and in Christianity and Platonism understand as we must separate mind from body. But wait a second. The body is the chieftain. He's going to lead us. The priest is the mind guy. He's going to give us a story on how we're going to be successful and why we must follow the chieftain. And it's the mutual admiration between the chieftain and the priest that's happening between Moses and Aaron. That's exactly why the product is successful. And Moses even symbolically, of course, dies before they enter the promised land. Not as a failed Messiah on a cross, but he dies before because the next generation are then going to step into and take over the promised land. Whereas Aaron goes with them into the promised land before he dies. So the priest actually goes with you all the way into the promised land. But what's important here is to understand the separation of priest and chieftain must not be understood as a separation that's internal to us. We are not mind and body. No, we are mind and body because the tribe, which is the metaphor we should use onto ourselves, the tribe needs both the priest and the chieftain. It needs both the, the, the mind and the body. This is where I think, this is where I think dualism went wrong and, 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 it, it, it mistook a duality that was necessary for the tribe to be successful and for the clan to be successful and for the nation to be successful and for empires to be successful, for any form of social organization between humans to be successful. It has to be led by the separation of leadership. And you know, you know it exactly what I mean, because if you do unite the priest and the chieftain, you get the tyrant. Mm. That's exactly what a dictatorship is. It's one guy who aspires to be both chieftain and priest at the same time, to both have a narrative dictated by him. That's why dictators write little books called Mouse Little Red and things like that, crappy, shit little books. That's what they do, that everybody then has to read. You know, Muammar Gaddafi in his green book. It's pathetic, but they force everybody to read a tiny little book that basically says that they, this one guy alone, is all they need. Mm, so they have everybody the storytelling and the physical means to push exactly. forward. Exactly. It's like what I say if you're a man. The penis between your legs, the literal phallus, and the symbolic phallus, the penis in your head, is like if you try to unite the two and make them into one, but really they should be kept separate. And in, in leadership and organization, when it comes to vision, you have to separate the priestly function from the chieftain function. But we also have to remember that when it comes to how women operate, and the women look up to older women, they do not operate the same way because... They are pushing the tribe forward. And at the end of the tribe, it's all about, do we have everybody with us? Do everybody with us? You don't need two different functions for that. But for the walk towards the promised land to be successful, you need both the mind guy and the body guy. And you need both mind experts and body experts because that's leading into unknown territory, which requires way more brain power. Whereas the matriarch is pushing forward and women are using as much brain power as men do, but half of their brain power goes into the child rearing process. So all you need is an older woman, a combined sort of priest and a combined sort of um, chieftain, but, but female that pushes forward. 
That's why female leaders often step into history when everything else has failed and we need to save the fucking shit that's going on. That's how female leaders, mad jerks, step in and often have to take over. And in all the really sound good religions, men and women are radically equal. It's just that we have a matriarchy that matches the patriarchy. It should be equally strong. Mm. Well, that's interesting given the, the turbulent state of the world at the moment and the fact that in the West, it certainly feels like things are, I don't know if breaking down is the word, but certainly things are shaking up. Do you expect the appearance of any matriarchal figures? Are there any already? I suppose I can think of like, what hey, you had one called Margaret Thatcher in England. I disagree with many of Thatcher's ideas politically, but she was definitely a matriarch. I think what she set out to do was to try to save the British Empire, if it was worth saving. And what you're seeing now is really the last end station of the fall of the British Empire, which is that Britain itself falls apart. Mm. It's only logical. I mean, we have a great model in Scandinavia for five different countries that live in peace with each other, don't go to war with each other, and actually make up their own minds about what they want to do while they can still understand each other. I think that's a perfect model for Britain. I think Scotland should be independent, Wales too, if they want to, and Northern Ireland should be handled back to the Irish, where it should have been all along. And, you know, it, it, you could have these three or four countries, and Britain would be pretty solid, and they can then choose if they want to be inside the European Union or not. We did in Scandinavia. Norway stayed out, Iceland stayed out, Sweden, and Denmark, and Finland opted in. Finland even went for the euro. Denmark went for the euro for practical purposes. Sweden stayed out. I mean, the Scandinavians love to disagree, apparently, and it works. Mm-hmm. Highly recommended for Britain. But I think what we're seeing now with Boris Johnson and everything is the British Empire finally falling apart completely because it is a failed empire and it's over. And I think Thatcher. As a conservative politician in the 1980s, a typical female mission, the matriarch steps in and tries to push Britain into the future, right? You know, she even did sign it into the European Union because she thought it was too weak to be outside, to be honest about it. Like, my baby's not going to survive unless it's within a bigger hole. So, you know, to all fairness, you have to admit that Thatcher actually plays into that role. And matriarchs are usually bitches that we're scared and terrified of. Because that's what's required when a woman steps into the role of being the ultimate leader. Because it is really a failure on the part of patriarchy. Mm. Yeah, patriarchy people hate to provide vision and strategy. Vision and strategy are as required of men as giving birth to children are required from women. So when I hear people today scream, crush the patriarchy, I'm saying, why the fuck do you want to crush something that works? Why don't you match it with whatever is lacking? So if matriarchy is lacking, then that has to be built. And I don't think young girls are not listening to older women even understand what a patriarchy or a matriarchy are. Because a patriarchy is that the older men educate and train the younger men to take over and lead. Matriarchy is the older women training, teaching, you know, supporting the younger women to one day, first of all, give birth to babies and then to lead. Mm. And when we're talking about matriarchy, older people, so something that pops into my head here is that we tend to keep old people at quite a distance in today's society. I think, like, I walk around London, I see very, very few old people. It seems like you get. 50s, 60s, and then retire off somewhere in the countryside and are out of sight and out of mind. And they're also tired of nightclubs and they don't do drugs any longer, so they prefer to live closer to golf course, in all fairness. I mean, <laughs> older people today are also not seeing the younger people because they're busy with themselves. They live 30, 40 years longer than they used to. And, you know, I, even I am 58 years old, and I'm beginning to see the charm now with goose liver pâtés and golf clubs. You know, I'm getting tired of the drug taking and the partying. Probably not really, but slightly less of it. Let's admit that, okay? Uh, but, you know, he, I'm shamanic and 58 years old. Hey, I'm allowed to do drugs, right? So anyway, um, but I would say the disconnection between generations, um, and I know it from having worked with Google, and we're terrified of it, and we see the data coming in, because 11-year-olds only talk to 11-year-olds, only talk to 11-year-olds online, and 58-year-olds talk to 58-year-olds, and 23-year-olds, 23-year-olds. If you look at the data on YouTube, for example, you discover that the generations are now falling into little boxes. We've never, ever seen that before in human history. Mm. It should terrify us. And I think also now the Indians and the Chinese are learning that what they're seeing in Europe and North America takes Sweden, most extreme example of all. 
70 or 80 percent of households in Stockholm are now single households. So even if you got tender in your pocket, it's, a, it's apparently failing you. You know, you, you get the dates, but they don't lead to anything else, right? Uh, I think especially young men are suffering from this new structure tremendously. I think women handle it better because they have stronger social connections outside of their homes. And if they feel lonely, they usually just go and get a dog and a new pair of shoes, right? Guys don't know how to handle that. So I feel a lot of men that only 50 years ago would have had their own farm and, you know, would have had their own little company. Now, instead, they're sitting alone in a, an apartment, a tiny apartment in a large city. And that's kind of shocking to them. So they shouldn't be there. They have to get, you know, rich social life and get out of nature and things like that to feel reasonably fine, you know. The pastoral meditation, as I mentioned before, is one of those things they need to do. So, um, but we failed, you know. It, yesterday, I filled in the form for my new visa to India. And it felt more modern than anything I do in Sweden because it did offer me three genders, male, female, or transgender, right? Mm. So that's a non-issue for Indian, in Indian lawmaking, apparently. They don't make much of a fuss of it like the Americans do. But I also had to fill in the name of my father and my mother, even if they were dead. They didn't care. The Indians don't consider you to have presented yourself unless you tell which family you come from and who your father and your mother are, which mm. we have seen and say Britain and Sweden, I think that's a big mistake. That connection with the previous generation has to be made and it has, we have to reconnect. And we also have to reconnect from the older back to the younger. Mm, I mean, this is something interesting. I spent three months in India a few years ago and I noticed that one of the things that really struck me was when people came to talk to me, that was, hello, what's your name? Are you married? Yeah. No one, no one asked me if I'm married here, but like that was... I suppose it's trying to ascertain what my role is within the social hierarchy. Am exactly. They don't, they don't mean you to then name drop the woman you're married to. That's not what they mean. What they mean is, that are you married in the fundamental sense? Are you connected? Mm. Who are you connected with? So this, the response to that is to say probably like, oh, you mean I haven't, no, I haven't had my wedding with a beautiful girl yet, anything like that all, but I am married to my cause, I'm married to my friends, I'm married to a connection. Uh, here, by the way, is my card, this is the company I work for. That's what they mean when they ask you if you're married. They, they mean, are you connected? How are you socially connected? That's what marriage, Ian, really probably, it really means from the very beginning. Maybe. Marriage was actually something done between military men originally 10,000 years ago, before they went out into war. And then when property arrived, through written language and permanent settlements, we started to arrange alliances between the tribes so we can turn the tribes into clans. And then suddenly we taught hunters or warriors not to kill each other, but to trade. And as soon as they started trading, we'd convince them like, maybe your daughter should marry his son. That, that, that is the arrangement of marriage. It, it really is the marriage between clans or the marriage between families, not between him or her. It's not about romantic love. It's about making social arrangements that are sustainable. Mm. So modern marriage is a kind of a parody of that, right? So um, this is what they mean. And without that connection, you're nobody. And that is a connection across generations for granted. I would say this, uh, I was a critic of Me Too when it arrived. And unfortunately it turned out I was right because I saw it as a terrible strategy for trying to communicate and deal with sexual harassment. It's the worst way of doing it. And really what was missing during Me Too was that the older women were absent. They weren't there. This is all about young girls with Instagram accounts and narcissistic egos screaming at the top of their lungs to get attention. Right? That's exactly why they cause so much havoc. In Sweden now, all that's left of the Me Too is just legal settlements. I mean, the courts are full of these cases of innocent men who are fighting back fiercely against the media houses, against the young girls. Some of these young girls that went on Instagram and like Me Too are going to end up in prison in Sweden. Because that is how severe the crimes were that they actually committed. You know, they made up stories about men and killed their lives and their families and everything in their process, literally in some cases. That sort of havoc is very similar to the Chinese cultural revolution. And we must be really, really aware of a society where young people think they can just go out and run out there and because of their feelings, they know the truth. Mm. That is terrifying if we, if we get that. So 
in that case, you need the older people to say, no, 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 wait a second, your feelings are not the truth. You need to learn shit first. You need to study properly. You need to know what you're talking about before you're appointed as a spokesperson or some kind of leader for a specific cause. And of course, an older woman would always say that if you're a young girl and you're seriously interested in preventing sexual harassment against women, you go and study law and become a lawyer. That's the way you do it. You don't run around on Instagram and scream and make up things about men that you don't even know. Mm. So we're gonna see a lot of these lynch mobs. They're gonna come from the guys too. It's, the alt right very much operates like a sort of masculine lynch mob instead of young men who are full of themselves and think they know it all. And off they run with all kinds of fantasies and feelings that they have. But sorry, your feelings are not facts. They're just your feelings, they're not the truth. The truth out there is factual. It's like the social media just amplifies the lowest common denominator when used in this way. I guess one of the things that's interesting in your work is the discussion between what is kind of shitty use of social media and good, powerful, networking, netocratic use of social media. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. Well, the problem with the internet is that Number one, we put a megaphone into the mouth of 8 billion people at the same time. So essentially everybody's online, everybody's screaming at the top of their lungs to get attention. It's like you, it's like you walk into a theater and suddenly the entire audience has left the room and they're all on the stage. They're all behaving as if there was an audience applauding them. But really, the audience space in the theater is empty. They're all on the stage, screaming at the top of the lungs. That's what we write about in Digital Libido, that it will pay off to become a voyeur now and not be an exhibitionist. Because we're so tired of exhibitionism, or narcissism, if you like, that we don't want any more of it. The new power elite, the netocrats, are definitely going to stay out of the public limelight. They don't want to be celebrities. They don't want to ever be involved in that any longer, because it's just a dirty minefield, essentially, now. So they're getting out of there, you know, they move to isolated places and they get the lives that they want and they communicate with the world through their Wi-Fi and through the systems and control it, but they're definitely going to be part of They're not going to be part of it, you know. The gated community has come to stay and it's going to go virtual next. Sorry to say it, but that's what's going to happen. Because everybody's screaming at the top of the lungs. This is also then a flat structure. So the internet does not provide you with a hierarchy to know who you're going to listen to. What then happens is that once this flat structure has existed for a couple of decades, which is the case now, meaning we're going to see in the 2020s how we're going to follow some people more and more and more, and the vast majority of people we're going to unfollow and not care about any longer, because we can only operate through hierarchy. The algorithms are already doing this for us. The algorithms are already providing us with a hierarchy, which will kill all traditional forms of communication. The next form to kill is marketing. So marketing is dead. Get out of marketing now. Marketing a product is just spam. It's nothing but spam. We hate it. You know, every time you talk to a company and their customer service, the next thing, two seconds later, you get a customer survey thrown into your spam box. It's just like, what the fuck? I don't want this. Stop harassing me with things I don't want. Okay. So the algorithms will kill all this because the algorithm will figure out what we do want and prevent us from ever seeing or hearing anything we don't want to see or hear. And that doesn't mean we're going to be in an echo chamber forever. Smart people have gotten out of the echo chamber already. They know that without antagonisms and without debating with people who disagree with me, I will never grow. Mm. So the echo chamber has become an underclass phenomenon. If you're smart, you get out of the echo chamber and you do find people who strongly disagree with you and you go into arguments and try to figure out what they mean and why they think the way they do, because that's how you learn. So we're going to see the 2020s. We're going to see some people mature and understand what the internet really is. And these are the people we call the netocrats in our book. They're going to rule the world, but they're going to be a small minority. We probably have to write an Exodus book next and say, these are the winners. This is how they operate. The rest of you could at best imitate them right? Because that's what's going to be the winning formula. But the vast majority of people will still sit there, have less and less followers, less and less understanding of what's going on, scream at the top of their lungs and not get attention. And they're going to be very bitter and resentful in the process. 
Mm. Be prepared for a huge Platonist Rousseauian revival. The social justice warriors we've seen already, the alt left and the alt right, we're gonna see more and more of that because what feeds into the alt right and the alt left is the resentment of being a loser online. Mm. And there are millions and millions of losers online today. They do pornography, they do computer games, they feel isolated, they feel nobody cares about them, nobody pays attention to them because they're incapable of creating anything that interests others. Mm. This sounds creating the entertainment we require online. We, we require infotainment. It's the mixture of, of qualitative information, quality entertainment we're looking for all the time when we go online, right? Mm. If, if you're not a part in producing that infotainment, you are already the new digital underclass to concentrate. And that's the vast majority of people.